Okay, we'll get started here. Good morning, and uh, members and staff, and uh, welcome to the Environment and Natural Resource Policy, Policy Committee remote hearing. And this is being held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. And uh, a few reminders here before we get started. Uh, and you've heard some of this already, folks on the line, but uh, uh, the committee staff will be muting and unmuting as we go uh, in this hearing, and uh, that will be announced. You'll, you'll hear a little announcement uh, from time to time uh, as people are being uh, unmuted. Uh, we've got a pretty tight schedule. As members know, we've got, uh, we've got a floor session here in a couple hours, so we're going to try and keep on time. And uh, and uh, in addition to the to uh, Representative Hassan, the bill author, we've got 14 testifiers, and we're asking the testifiers to keep it to two minutes. And uh, there will be a, uh, you'll hear a beep if you're testifying, and and it gets to about a minute 45 seconds. It's, just uh, that's just our our way of asking you to wrap it up pretty quick, and uh, but we just don't have we don't have any more than an hour and a half altogether, and we want to have time for uh, questions from from members uh, if, if there are any. So we want to make sure we have that time. Um, and uh, would uh, Addy would you uh, announce or whoever's going to announce uh, the members and staff that we have? Uh, joining us on the call today. Yes, Mr. Chair and members, we have Chair Purcell, Representative Lewick, Representative Acom, Representative Bell, Representative Fabian, Representative Green, Representative Heinzman, Representative Lippert, Representative Lislagard, Representative Wagenia. We have Addie Miller, that's me, Committee Administrator, Kevin Petrie, Committee Legislative Assistant, Janelle Taylor from House Research, Bob Eva from House Research. Eric Anderson from DFL Research and House Public Information Services. Very good. Thank you. Um, and we do have testifiers on the line. Uh, and uh, public notice was given, and members of the public who wish to testify have contacted, that have contacted our staff are on the call. Uh, as we proceed, members, uh, if you have a question or wish to be recognized, if you'd please email or text the committee administrator, um, Addie Miller, uh, and I, I'm understanding that that has that your num your phone number and, uh, and for texting and, and uh, email address has been transmitted. Is that correct, Addie? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end, uh, and uh, uh, so so what, if you if you want to be recognized, you need to email or text, and and, uh, and I'll recognize you. We'll be taking questions at the end, so please write down the the name of the the testifier uh, to whom you wish to direct your question. Um, Today we have House File 4954, uh, uh, Representative Hassan Bill, and Representative Hassan is, is here to present that bill for us. This is an informational hearing, so we'll not be taking any votes. Um, and uh, I think we're ready to proceed here. Uh, Representative Hassan, are you ready to tell us about your bill? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, it's worth noting that this is my first time presenting to this committee. I hope next time I can present under a different circumstances. I want to thank you for um, hearing this bill. It is a very important legislation for my district. I also want to thank Chair Purcell and Representative Gomez for joining me as co-authors. It's my hope the rest of you will join me after this presentation today. For many, the scariest part of COVID-19 crisis is how quickly it's laying bare the structural flaws in our society. My constituents in South Minneapolis who are largely black, brown, and indigenous community 
were already facing crises such as chronic stress related to food and housing insecurity, as well as many health challenges caused by environmental racism before the fires came along. This community bears a disproportionate burden of tax, toxic cont contamination as a result of pollution in and around their neighborhood. Historically, black, brown, and indigenous communities are much too often the first to experience environmental harm and the last to experience environmental benefits. According to UFM Public Health Research, an African-American child is three times more likely to go to the emergency room for an asthma attack than a white child and twice likely to die from it. Furthermore, African-American and American Indian children have the highest asthma rates in the state and face some of the biggest challenges in managing the disease. Hence, environmental racism contributes largely to this issue. Today, I present to you to House File 4594, an act relating to environment, modifying cumulative impact analysis requirements requiring permits for certain demolitions and amending Minnesota Statute 2018, Section 116.07, Subdivision 4A, and adding a subdivision. This bill does a few things. Number one, the bill would modify an existing law that requires the Pollution Control Agency before issuing an air permit to a facility located with an area meeting certain conditions, a portion of South Minneapolis, to analyze and consider the cumulative level of past and current environmental pollution from all sources of geographic area in which the permitted facility emissions are likely to be deposited. And two, the bill would provide a new option for residents in the area to petition for a similar analysis in cases where an air permit for a project is not required. The petition would need to be signed by at least 200 residents. And thirdly, the bill also established a new provision that would require a permit from the PCA before demolishing a structure with more than an unspecified amount of square feet in the specified area had required the PCA to complete a similar cumulative impact analysis before issuing the permit. All in all, we're not trying to invent anything new here. We're rather modifying an existing statute and adding on more protections to close any loopholes. I'm sure some of you who strongly believe in local control would appreciate what we're trying to do here. We're making sure the community in East Phillips which has been impacted by environmental racism for many years, have a say in what happens in their neighborhood. With that, I'll let my testifiers explain more, and we'll stand for questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hassan. And uh, I have a uh, uh, testifier, um, Karen, Karen Clark. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Purcell, and uh, thank you, Representative Hassan, for bringing this bill for our community. Um, I wanted to also say hello to former colleagues. I used to serve with you on some some of these issues, and I appreciate that you're here to to listen to this this uh, bill. Basically, what we're doing is we're supporting exactly what Representative Hassan just talked about. House File 4594 will amend existing law that I and Senator Berglund passed in 2008 that created a special um, threshold for environmental toxic exposure in East Phillips neighborhood because this is a low-income neighborhood with majority people of color and Native American residents. Um, and as she pointed out, it already has an existing burden, um, overburden of this contamination. Um, we need to bring this law forward because we've been working on a proposal in this area and the city of Minneapolis uh, claims that they're not covered by this law. Um, so we're trying to cover any loopholes that they might want to cite. We want them to honor this environmental justice law and they have claimed that they um, do not need to have any permits to do um, the work they're proposing. We believe they do. My understanding in talking with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is that they basically support what we're trying to do here, the community's need for environmental justice, and um, we want to go forward with that. You're going to hear from several uh, people in the neighborhood, residents. Uh, the, the, the site where this is occurring um, is about two blocks from where I live, and you're going to hear from residents who live right across the street. For example, at Little Earth of United Tribes, the next person will be talking. Her name um, is Cassie Holmes, and she is going to be speaking to us um, from Adachana, I appreciate that you made a great effort to be here. 
her family has been deeply impacted by this disproportionate uh, racial environmental exposure to toxic substances. So I'm going to save any other comments for questions that you may have. And we've decided that we want to give Cassie more of our time so she will be taking the place of several other constituents um, uh, of Representative Hassan uh, with her time. So please allow her to speak um, a few more minutes beyond uh, what we, the rest of us are speaking. So Cassie, would you like to go forward? Please, Hello, please, everybody. Please proceed, Ms. Holmes. Okay, thank you. First, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be on here. My name is Cassandra Holmes, and I'm a resident at the Little Earth of United Tribes, um, where we have about 1,500 people there, over 1,500, and half of them are children. Um, and I just want to say that um, being a resident there for many years, um, I do see the impact that the pollution has on the people there, on our elders and on our kids, and um, just seeing that them, most of our kids have asthma issues, and we're starting to see more of um, heart issues and to, in our youth. Um, anybody who can see the, the pictures here that we have for, um, or it says a green, green uh, for East Phillips, you'll see on picture six, there's a group of me with a group of youth. Those youth are youth who work in our garden at the Little Earth um, Garden. And we have different youth that participate in our garden every year, and they take a lot of pride in working in that garden. They make money, and they um, go school shopping. So we try to connect working in our garden and being able to provide their own school clothes and whatever else they need for school, and they take a lot of pride in that. They, they come into... Um, the Lira office, they do their own, they ask for job applications, they do, um, you know, they talk with um, their, the employer right there, they come out so excited, their smiles on their face, they're so happy, they just applied for a job and got it all on their own, filled out their own paperwork, and they get to work, and then I'm one of the people who helps them go shopping at the end for school clothes. On the next picture is my son Trinidad at 16 years old. And uh, there's two pictures of him, and he's in red, surrounded by leaves. And then if you go down, you'll see a picture of a chest that's been open. That's my son's chest, who at the age of 14 all of a sudden had a heart disease nobody knew about. <clears throat> I'm sorry. But... He passed away when he was 16 years old from a heart disease. He was healthy when he was younger. And after Trinidad passed away, we start. We had two more young people pass away. A 21-year-old who was a friend of mine, just had her second baby, passed away from a heart disease. Nobody knew she had a heart disease. None of the doctors knew. And then we had another young girl pass away from a heart disease. And what's crazy is that all three of these young people lived on the same side in Little Earth. And now we're starting to ask questions in our community. How many more of our children pass away because of this, because of the area we live in? And we just didn't connect the dots. We just didn't think about it. And now we're thinking about it because we're scared. We're scared out of our minds because we know that there's a plan in place. And that plan is to tear down a building that is right next to us. And we know that building holds down a lot of arsenic. We have, I don't even know what else this building holds down. at the It's at the Roof Depot site. And what's scary to us is that we're already battling so much at the Little Earth and in East Phillips, all of East Phillips, that we do know that if this building gets knocked down, we're terrified that this is like a form a genocide. This is going to hurt our generations for hundreds of years because we're already trying to battle what we have to battle when it comes to pollution and our community and health issues. And if, and if we have to deal with that, that's scary. We're terrified. It's almost, we're almost fearful to the point where we're like, we're not going to exist right there. 
We represent over 38 different tribes in Middle Earth. So I just want to let you guys know that these are tears. These are real tears. This is a real fear. This is not only for me, but hundreds of people at Middle Earth. We are terrified of what's going to happen to us. And we just want people to recognize, and we want our people that we vote in to help us, to help us fight for our rights, for our environmental rights and justice. We have a plan as a community. As community, we know, we know we can better ourselves. We just need the backing, and we need people to listen to us and to understand that we have real fears. And we have our fears are not just coming out of nowhere. They come because we've experienced great loss. And that's I just want to I just wanted to bring that to the table. I wanted to bring this personal experience, this heartbreak to the table, and I want you guys to understand how scary this is for us and how we need your help. Thank you, Ms. Holmes. Um, that's, some, that's some pretty tough testimony, but uh, thank you for giving it. Um, and uh, I've got on the list here uh, Dean, the next testifier, Dean DeVolos. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, good morning and thank you for the committee to take time to uh, hear us out. A uh, quick background myself, I'm president of the East Phillips Neighbor Institute, uh, the group that has worked very hard on the site to provide alternative development uh, options. I'm also CEO of DJR Architecture and in addition I'm also developing agricultural and aquaculture and agriculture indoor in uh, Africa. We were hoping to develop on the site, but due to the politics of the city, the East African community brought me to Africa, and that's where we have actually a facility under construction right now. We're honored to do that, but I hope that we have the honor to develop this in Minneapolis in the Phillips neighborhood. The reason why I'm testifying is to say that Hassan's bill President Hassan's bill is not anti-development. It's just a different type of development. It provides a green development and it provides options for the neighborhood uh, residents and it also provides local food distribution, which is key. As you know, that our food network is broken down due to the COVID crisis and the more that we key that we can be that we can diversify our food distribution, the safer we are. Our proposal had incorporated a preserving the roof people building for indoor agricultural and aquaculture, and we have the investments and investors that actually do it. We also propose a 45,000 square foot addition to the project, so that would go for the more high-tech portion. So we had a low-tech portion that would really serve residents of older to give them the opportunity to get into the business, and we had a high-tech portion that was more intensive. A facility, a facility like this could produce up to 400 pounds of food, of green leafy vegetables, for in tons, I should say, annually for the neighborhood and provide a diversity of jobs and economic opportunity. So this is really important for us, not for the idea of the bill itself, but the idea of economic diversity, for the idea of spreading out polluting industries because the tendency has always been to put more pollution in an area that's already polluted. But now you're hearing the results of what that has done. So through Karen Clark's previous work and Hassan's work, we hope to open up an opportunity for green industry, new industry, and we stand ready to proceed on this site if we're successful the legislature. So we're honored to work with the neighborhood. We know that our alternative is successful and we can provide a feature that Cassie and others can be very proud of. So thank you again for hearing us out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeVolos, will you say your name for the record in case I'm not pronouncing it right, please? Yes, Dean, D-E-A-N, last name DeVolos, D-O-V-O-L-I-S. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, the next yes. testifier is not... Uh, the next testifier is not on the call, so we can proceed to Mr. Pass. Okay, very good, very good. Thank you for that. 
Okay. Um, next, I have uh, Brad Pass, and uh, please uh, state your name for the record and uh, proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Brad Pass, P-A-S-S, and uh, I've lived in the neighborhood uh, for 53 years. Um, my wife is the president of uh, the uh, EPIC, which is the East Phillips Improvement Coalition, and she had a heart attack uh, last year and was not able to be here today because of that. Uh, I have, we have seen three generations of, of children in our neighborhood uh, suffer as a result of the pollution that is there. We have an asphalt plant and we have a, uh, a foundry uh, just across, literally across the street from a children's playground, a daycare center, and a uh, half a block away from the United Tribes. Uh, we. Um, are, uh, we are also literally next door to the arsenic uh, triangle, which is the Superfund site that was necessitated because uh, in the 30s, a uh, chemical plant started uh, storing arsenic uh, right on the ground in our neighborhood in order to combat uh, the uh, 1930s uh, grasshopper invasion out in the western states. Now that that arsenic it has been encapsulated underneath the roof depot site. We found that we, being the neighborhood, found that the roof depot site, uh, about uh, 6.7 acres, is, was going to come up for sale back in 2014. Because of so much pollution in this neighborhood and the negative effects that it's having on our children, they get sick with asthma, they can't go to school, they, they uh, are affected, uh, their whole life is affected by this pollution that's already here. So when the Roof Depot site came up uh, for sale, the neighborhood came together and recognized that we had absolutely had to control this site and prevent another polluting industry from adding to the trauma of this neighborhood. We negotiated with the uh, owners of the Roof Depot. We came up with a $5 million price for the, for the land. They were happy with our project. They liked our, liked our project. As a matter of fact, so many other organizations, people, and investors liked our project that we had $9 million allocated uh, for this project without even trying. Then the city heard about it. They used the, the threat of eminent domain to purchase this whole property out from under us. They never pulled the trigger on eminent domain, but they used the threat. That was enough. And now uh, we're in, so then we, we, we formed uh, this organization called EPNI, East Phillips Neighborhood Institute, and we we, uh, we formed a plan. Dean Devalis helped us, Karen Clark helped us, and the plan uh, was to create something that's actually positive for this neighborhood. That's the East Phillips Indoor Urban Farm Program. Mr. Pass, this is, this is Chair Persellian. Please, please, I need you to wrap it up. Okay, uh, with the help of the state of Minnesota, who gave, uh, who, uh, gave us $319,000, a deed grant, to, uh, to uh, uh, make this plan work, we came up, uh, even after the city bought the pro uh, project, we came up with two alternative plans. And uh, one of them is indicated on the brochure that you have uh, in front of you. You can see this, and I won't take up any more time. But our plan is a, is a plan that will work for the, for the neighborhood. It will provide local jobs, second chance opportunities, housing, uh, affordable housing. Uh, even with the compromise uh, the three acre plan, we can provide 28 affordable family housing units, which is so desperately needed in our community. And again, we just want to emphasize that the city right now is 
saying they are not subject to any of the recommendations of the health impact assessment that has already been uh, created on this land. They don't have to pay any attention to the recommendations of the green zone of which we are a part. And we think we can do a lot better. And we're willing to compromise, but we have never been allowed to have our, our project heard by any uh, City of Minneapolis uh, City Council meeting or any any uh, planning session at the uh, 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 Public Works. Uh, so anyway, I'll sign off here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pass. And uh, uh, I have next uh, Steve Sandberg. If you please proceed. Um, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Say your say your name for the record, please, Sue. Thank you. Uh, yes. My name is Steve Sandberg, and I'm a resident uh, neighbor here in uh, East Phillips neighborhood. Um, I'm down by the Roof Depot site right now, um, standing where the plume of snake is underneath my feet. There's a test well, um, you know, right in front of me along the edge of the, you know, this beautiful building. Um, I just want to say that uh, the reason for the the uh, original bill that Karen Clarkson and Linda Berglund passed was because of the health impacts associated with being um, in the vicinity of this arsenic Superfund site. And uh, we uh, are uh, very much hoping that uh, this building, which in any other neighborhood would be um, preserved and be the, the, the stimulus for um, all kinds of uh, business incubation. It's a it's a amazing building. Half the square footage of the IDS building, 230,000 square feet. The, the curved wall follows what was the the rail line uh, that is now the uh, greenway that goes uh, through our neighborhood. And we would like a portion of our neighborhood to be deindustrialized as it has been along other portions of Minneapolis of the greenway. But um, I'm also watching all these trucks. I, I sent photos of the traffic congestion that we already have. I'm downwind from the foundry and the asphalt plant, which are both cranking. There's uh, tandem duck trucks with with uh, their boxes full of, of uh, asphalt uncovered uh, going by from the asphalt plant. Uh, I mean, this is this is very real pollution that should not be in a residential neighborhood and is the reason that we are trying to create some social infrastructure and some green jobs. You've heard of now with COVID how uh, neighborhoods like ours are, are facing greater impacts. You've heard that there's um, the food supply has been interrupted. We would be, would be um, contributing to food security by our, our neighborhood plan. We have uh, a uh, really a, a wonderful plan for this building, which um, um, uh, and but the main thing is that we need something other than further industrialization, further diesel trucks um, in our neighborhood, and um, uh, we need this bill strengthened. And so I'm very happy that Representative Hassan um, and you, Chairman, have uh, helped uh, bring this to light. And um, so I'm recommending that that this be uh, passed. Uh, very much for the good of our neighborhood. So thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Sandberg. And uh, I have next uh, uh, Chad uh, Hebert or Herbert, if you'd uh, please say your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, yeah, good morning and thank you, Chair Purcell and committee members. My name is Chad Hebert and I work with the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute on their indoor urban farm project. I am also a program manager for Little Earth of the United Tribes, where I work on food access and food security issues. I'm here today to testify um, to really lay out some facts. So the bill um, that Representative Hassan has put forward would strengthen existing law and allow the residents of East Phillips to know what any development is going to bring to their neighborhood. The average lifespan of a water yard for the city of Minneapolis is 125 years. So the residents of East Phillips feel that they should know what they're going to deal with for the next 125 years. 
I know there's no direct appropriations tied to this bill, but uh, there are always costs. And I certainly, when you consider the cost to do this bill, I, I hope the committee members wouldn't consider that the limiting factor, because you also need to consider the cost of not doing a bill like this. Average cost for an asthma patient is about $40,000 a year in medical expenses. The average cost of a heart transplant is $1.4 million. And so really, I, I urge the committee members to move this bill forward and ask pertinent questions um, so the residents of East Phillips can have healthy and environmental justice for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hebert. Um, Mr. And, uh, yes. We can move to um, Mr. Leader next, and we have also been joined on the call by Representatives Anderson and Fabian. Very good. Uh, welcome, members. Um, and let me, I'm, I'm looking at my, what was Mr. Leader? Is that the next, you said adding? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, next we have then uh, Kevin Leader. Um, if you're, uh, you could say say your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Great, thank you. My name is Kevin Leader. I've lived in the East Phillips neighborhood for 20 years, and uh, I just like to comment that with you know, all due respect to Ms. Hassan and Ms. Clark and others who are pushing for this bill. I think it's a good idea to battle pollution, both previous and ongoing. But I think um, the purpose of this bill is being used as a device to wrest control of the Roof Depot site from the city of Minneapolis by the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute. The plans that EPNI want to implement would involve removing parking lot surface, and I believe that would expose the ground as well. And I just don't see how that's going to you know, protect people from the existing pollution that's in the ground. I believe uh, the, the, uh, the city would, if they're going to remove the building, they're going to have to deal with the pollution that's in the ground. And I believe forcing them to do that is a good idea. And I, that's, the, that's the motion that I would go in. But frankly, I don't agree with the continuous statements by the community that the community or the community leaders, that it, the entire community supports the creation of an indoor urban farm. This has been going on for several years, and I don't recall being surveyed as a community representative's claim. They, they claim they have overwhelming support, but I know there's people on my block who they never received a survey either. The people behind the urban farm do not have business experience in this kind of project. They can't afford to build the business, so they've asked the government to fund the building of their business, and I'm afraid that they will continue to ask the government to support the business on an ongoing basis. I believe the cost for site cleanup regarding the previous pollution will be the burden of the government regardless of who occupies the site. The urban farm folks will be after the government to pay for the cleanup because it existed before they bought it, so somebody else has to clean it up. I think the consolidation of the public works facilities makes sense. I think the centralizing the public works facility makes sense. And I understand they will have a job training facility as part of the project. That's what people in this neighborhood need. They don't need 400 tons of vegetables. They need jobs. They can go and go get their vegetables. And the kind of jobs that the training would be provided by this kind of facility will be the kind of jobs that people will be looking for even more after this coronavirus episode is over. They're going to be looking for essential jobs. And that's the kind of jobs working for the city provides. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Leader. <clears throat> Next, I have Aaron Lightfeather. <clears throat> you uh, say your name for the record, and please proceed with your testimony. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, my name is Aaron Lightfeather. Um, I come from St. River First Nation. I'm a full-blooded Anishinaabe, and I wanted to... Um, I was here to be asked, you know, because I was reading upon this um, and was told by many residents of the uh, South Minneapolis community. Um, I, I lived here for nine years of my time, um, 
And since I've been living here, um, I have gone to college, and I almost graduated with my two-year associate degree. But during that time, um, personally myself, um, I kind of got myself into debt. Now, um, just a couple of years ago, I joined a program through the whole chunk community that came to the south of Minneapolis to help out uh, Native Americans um, to get into the world of construction and to become a unionized member because they felt as though that it was um, part of our people to get involved in jobs, uh, livable jobs, as you know, as the same thing as equal as an uh, associate's degree or a bachelor's degree job um, with their living wages of uh, their salary. So, you know, two years ago, I graduated this program uh, to join the union through the whole chunk community. Um, now I'm a part of the local 563. Uh, basically, our community needs good-paying union jobs to fully support the city's plan to build a training center and train for in-demand jobs, and plus our neighborhood has priority hiring for these jobs. Um, I feel as though that uh, this, this training center would be an excellent opportunity for our youngsters, for future generations and many moons to come, to give... Um, to give what it's like to know what it's like to build the infrastructure of today and America's based upon it is the backbone for these kind of essential jobs and um, what I'm saying is that I request um, I request and I support this building of this training center um, now you know pollution is going to be everywhere that's just you know that's going to be everywhere this vegetable this vegetable thing that they have of which I'm understanding um, today it, that's not going to be an essential job because everywhere else that you go, you can get vegetables. Um, so what I'm trying to say, what my point is, is Bill, I recommend and I support this training center. Like I said again, to train for the in-demand jobs, and especially in this need of this community, because this community is, um, it is kind of broken in other words, you know, as far as the opportunities and to give um these opportunities to these minorities that are suffering because they return. Hello? Oh, Hello? Thank You're you. Still on. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I just I just wanted to say my point. Uh, thank you for being and listening to my concerns and uh, my testimony. And uh, you guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lightbeller. Uh, next on... The testifier list here is uh, Lisa Bender. Um, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Purcell and members of the committee. Thank you so much. My name is Lisa Bender, and I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. And with me today is Robin Hutchison, our director of public works at the city of Minneapolis. We're both here to provide some background information about the city's planned expansion of the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility, which is the subject of this legislation, and answer any questions you may have. The Hiawatha Maintenance Facility is critical to our ability to provide clean, safe drinking water to the homes and businesses in Minneapolis and to the eight communities that rely on the city of Minneapolis for their water. Public Works is working very closely with MPCA, including on cleanup of this site. The city of Minneapolis also holds ourselves to the highest environmental review standards, conducting studies in accordance with all MPCA requirements with full transparency. This week, we opened a new Public Works facility on University Avenue which includes sustainable stormwater features, solar power, and more. Um, all of these features are proposed for the Hiawatha campus in addition to many others that Director Hutchison can describe. Phase one of the Hiawatha campus was constructed less than 10 years ago. That building is lead platinum and heated and cooled with geothermal heating. An expansion of the Hiawatha campus to include water system maintenance creates efficiency and reduces overall vehicle miles traveled by co-locating services in a central location. This project began over a decade ago. The city acquired the site for $7 million, and the Minneapolis City Council approved that purchase along with a master plan. That approval came in 2018 after extensive community engagement and multiple public hearings before the city council. In addition to environmental commitments, the master plan included extensive community engagement, city assistance for neighborhood development on nearby sites, and the inclusion of a recruitment and training center that Mr. Lightfeather just referenced. We also attempted to reach agreement on land donation, which was ultimately unsuccessful. We are disappointed to see this localized bill come forward in this way. We are concerned that layering of cumulative impacts 
duplicates much of our work and will delay this critical project and increase costs borne by taxpayers when our community needs are at an all-time high and our revenues are decreased by hundreds of millions of dollars. We would welcome partnerships from the state on any number of environmental justice issues, such as reducing the impacts of the nearby state highway, approaching the neighborhood businesses that Mr. Pass mentioned that are high polluters, and we have extraordinary interest in partnering with you to um, mitigate and reduce that pollution, uh, relocate those businesses, and so on. We'd be happy to work together to pursue further land donation if the state is, is interested in that. Rather than pursue this bill, we ask that you support our efforts to provide clean, safe water for Minneapolis and to use this opportunity to pre create a model, a model project with significant community benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Bender. Um, next on my list is Robin Hutchison. If you'd say your name for the record and, uh, and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Purcell and members of the committee. My name is Robin Hutchison. I'm the Director of Public Works for the City of Minneapolis, and I appreciate the opportunity to join Council President Bender. Uh, today, the Hiawatha Maintenance Facility occupies eight acres at 1901 East 26th Street with approximately 350 uh, employees at this site. From this facility, we keep our streets maintained. We plow snow, repair bridges, build bike lanes and safer pedestrian facilities, and we maintain our city's sewer system. The expansion of the site includes the relocation and consolidation of the city's water distribution operation. That operation distributes over 55 million gallons a day to over 500 people uh, ensuring safe drinking water to our residents and businesses in eight suburban communities. Our crews maintain and repair over a thousand miles of water mains and distribute uh, waters at ensure that 8,000 fire hydrants are in working order, over 100,000 water meters and 15,000 isolation valves to make sure that we are able to respond to emergencies. Today, the water distribution team works out of an undersized 100-year-old building that is difficult to maintain. It is not ADA compliant, and it simply does not meet our needs of a growing city, a thriving city. The consolidation of these groups into a centrally located site will improve our responsiveness and efficiencies, including responding to emergencies such as severe storms, flooding, water main breaks, and resiliency in the face of a changing climate and environment. Our site plans include numerous environmental features. It will be solar power ready uh, with 100,000 square feet of building rooftops outfitted for solar panels. Uh, we're working through a green fleet conversion, uh, maximizing it by scaling our uh, charging stations beginning right now and uh, putting electric vehicles on that site. Um, we'll be treating our stormwater on site with rain gardens and retention features. We'll be constructing a LEED certified building We'll be building a landscape buffer. We're performing site remediation, working closely with the NPCA and the Department of Agriculture. We'll be installing new public artwork and making street improvements to improve safety and livability in the community. And finally, we'll be constructing a new job training facility on the campus to enhance opportunities for Minneapolis residents to be placed in living wage jobs with high quality benefits. The training facility will include classrooms, and additional space will be available for community use and for after hours and on weekend gatherings when we can gather. Uh, our recruitment efforts will be focused on the neighborhoods first, uh, but we hope that we'll serve all, uh, all of Minneapolis. And I, I just want to be clear that no diesel equipment will be used at this training facility, and we are seeking a hands-on approach to technology um, and trade training. Uh, as the council president said, we've been through several rounds of engagement. Um, through 2018, um, we convened a Hiawatha advi advisory committee um, trying to come to some agreement and compromise on uh, first one acre that could be made available, then after further study, two acres that could be made available. Uh, neither offer was satisfactory. We continue to convene this advisory committee through 2019, and we will continue to seek community input for the landscape buffer, for urban agriculture opportunities, and for public art. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I will stay on the line along with Council President Bender for any follow-up questions. Thank you, Ms. Hutchinson. Um, I 
next have uh, testifier uh, uh, Ms. Greta Gauthier, uh, MPCA Assistant Commissioner. Um, please uh, announce yourself and proceed, Ms. Gauthier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. My name is Greta Gauthier, and I'm Assistant Commissioner at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on House File 4594, uh, a bill authored by Representative Hassan. Um, the MPCA and the Walls Administration have a strong commitment to environmental justice and have asked for all our agencies to look at our work with a lens toward equality. MPCA is generally supportive of this bill based on our work with the neighborhood over the years and with others, and we remain open to discussing this bill. Since this bill would set up a new and expanded program addressing cumulative impacts in the Phillips neighborhood, we do need to consider the cost. MPCA estimates a cost of $595,000 for the two cumulative impact analyses that may be needed under this bill and to get the new demolition permitting program um, established in this bill to get that program up and running. In addition, this bill does put the MPCA, uh, a state agency, squarely into local land use issues, specifically, um, and while the intent may be broader, the immediate issue is the possible demolition by the city uh, of Minneapolis of the Roof Depot building. MPCA has been working closely with the Environmental Quality Board to understand the issues related to environmental review of this project site. We have also been in close contact with the city of Minneapolis about their need to submit an applicability determination prior to the start of any project. Also, we have advised the city that they should not start demolition prior to submitting their applicability determination and getting a response on it from the MPCA. We want to work with the authors, the community leaders, the city, any interested parties to find the best path forward, whether through the permitting process, as is in this bill, through environmental review, or for some other means for this site and for others like it, in Minnesota so that public health and the environment are protected and so that environmental injustices of the past can be addressed moving forward. Thanks for again for the opportunity to testify, Mr. Chairman. I do have a couple other people here with me from the MPCA, um, Mr. Frank Kolash and Ms. Helen Wachu, and we are happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner <clears throat> Gauthier. Um, and uh, I'm looking here, I, and I, that's that's the end of the testifier list that I have. But is there anybody that I'm missing, uh, um, Addie? Um, no, there's not, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of representatives uh, for questions. Okay. Okay. Then we are prepared uh, now to to take questions. Um, and uh, if, uh, Addie, if you would uh, please uh, announce uh, members who wish to be recognized and, and proceed uh, uh, with that part of the uh, hearing. Sure. Mr. Chair and members, we just have Representative Wiginius and Representative Lewis on the list. Very good. Then uh, please proceed. Uh, this is Representative Wikinia. Uh Thanks all for testifying. Uh, for City uh, Council Member Bender, uh, does this plan include a new parking ramp? I thought I had heard about one. And if so, what is that ramp's impact on the air quality in the neighborhood? Thank you for the question, Representative Yes, I will defer to Director Hutchison for specific details about the project proposal. Uh, Representative Wagenius and Chair Purcell, um, yes, the site does include the construction of a, a parking ramp. As I mentioned, we have 350 employees on site today. We'll be adding another 140 
um, and uh, some equipment that goes along with it. The ramp is a dual purpose. It will house um, uh, equipment that needs to be in shelter and away from the elements as well as provide uh, storage for vehicles. Um, a transportation demand management study is being conducted right now to understand very clearly uh, the transportation effects and all of the mitigation strategies that will come along with it. If I could follow up. Please. Proceed. How big is this parking lot then? Um, uh, Representative Virginius, Chair Purcell, um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, 350 employees plus 140 plus the need to store equipment on the first level. We had initially anticipated that it would need to be for about 400 vehicles total for both purposes. Um, that would be the maximum, and through the transportation demand management plan that we're creating, we would seek to lower that number. If I could follow up again, Mr. Chair. Please, uh, I think this is an, an indication of a problem on, first of all, an air quality level and a cumulative impact, but also we are very close here to a light rail transfer station, and I am curious why, as part of the plan, folks would not be parking remotely and coming to work on light rail. Representative Wagenia, thank you so much for that question. Uh, we wholeheartedly agree, and our efforts through the TDMP will look at all of the ways our employees can access the site without having to bring private vehicles to the site, going so far as to look at generalized zip code data so that we can target our uh, demand management efforts where we're going to be most successful, whether that be encouraging light rail, um, having better bicycling facilities, the greenway is in close proximity, and making it safer and more comfortable for walking. This, this, this Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, just in uh, that was uh, Ms. Ms. Hutchison was that was speaking before. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to make sure we have everybody on the record. So, um, so uh, Representative Genius, any follow up? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, who's next to testify, Addy? Uh, Representative Lewick. <laughs> Please proceed, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, committee members, uh, this, uh, for a rather uh, unique uh, hearing here. Uh, obviously, we're way, way past uh, deadlines, uh, and uh, uh, I would, I believe it would be out of order for uh, <clears throat> to ask for a vote, uh, but I would first ask the chair, uh, is it uh, possible that uh, we could have a roll call vote here on uh, whether the uh, committee uh, would uh, <clears throat> support uh, this bill uh, or not? It, Representative Lewis, it's not my intention to have a vote today. Uh, okay, thank thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. In that, in that case, I don't want to belabor the circumstance here, uh, uh, but I do have a comment here. <clears throat> uh, obviously, this is a uh, important, absolutely critical local. Uh, decision as to uh, how this community and the city of Minneapolis proceeds uh, uh, with this project. And I would just uh, offer a couple of suggestions, uh, particularly to our, uh, <clears throat> to our newer uh, uh, state legislators that may be on the committee right now. Uh, and uh, also my, uh, my former colleague, uh, Representative Clark, and I think she's pretty well uh, uh, versed in uh, the critical role that you play within a community. And one of the most important things uh, that you deal with uh, is not necessarily sitting here in a committee hearing, but really shepherding your community through these very tough decisions. And, uh, you know, I've been around for uh, probably uh, at least uh, 
twice as many years as uh, uh, the author's uh, <clears throat> been on the earth. Uh, but what I've learned is uh, be very cautious about uh, taking sides when you have uh, such an important uh, 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 and controversial decision here, and do your best to shepherd the community, working with all of the local f officials, uh, to finally come up with a decision. Uh, it's obvious we've, you know, these are the kind of hearings that, well, this is, this is a great opportunity to get a lot of the facts out in front of the people. It would seem that this hearing this is the kind of hearing that should be taking place right in the community with the uh, with your elected representatives uh, and appointed people from the city of Minneapolis. I guess uh, uh, I think your real issue here is uh, not with uh, pollution control in the state of Minnesota. Your real issue here is with Mayor Fry and the city council. And uh, uh, I would just be very cautious about asking ever for the state to step in and take a hammer approach to uh, solving a local issue. It usually just uh, festers and, uh, and it doesn't solve it. So with that, Mr. Chair, I appreciate your indulgence, uh, particularly this unique circumstance and, and uh, uh, in getting, you know, getting some publicity for this issue, but this is clearly a local issue. Uh, and I would encourage your Representative Hassan and, and my former colleague, uh, uh, Representative Clark, to continue to work uh, productively with the city of Minneapolis to solve this. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Representative Lewis. I, uh, uh, thank you for your good words. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, as, as you have, I've heard mentioned several times in our conversation this morning, uh, the willingness to communicate uh, on, on both sides of this issue and I'm uh, I'm hopeful as you are that that uh, that communication can can lead to a, uh, lead to a solution that uh, that everybody can support in this neighborhood. Uh, so I, I'm uh, uh, thanks again, Representative Luke. That was uh, good comments. Um, any other uh, any other folks have questions? Uh, Addy? Yes, Mr. Chair, Representative Gomez. Uh, please proceed. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to Representative Hassan for bringing this forward, and especially to all of the community members who are participating today and who have been really involved in this over many years. Um, I, I guess I just, I just want to say a couple of things about this uh, site in particular, and uh, some of our testifiers spoke to the long-standing issues in this area. Um, it's, you know, this is a, East Phillips neighborhood is a disproportionately impacted neighborhood. It's the majority people of color and indigenous people, has high rates of asthma and elevated blood lead levels, heart disease, cancer, kind of a lot of the um, underlying health issues that make um, air pollution much more dangerous for people. Um, air pollution kills kills people, and it disproportionately kills people who live in neighborhoods like East Phillips. Um, so, like, the definition of environmental justice has to do with disproportionate burden. It's like, it's about when a really large group of people gets the benefit of a project, and a very small group of people has to bear the burden. And so this is very much in that realm. The the entire city will benefit from the water distribution system. And in fact, um, you know, Minneapolis provides water distribution services to other um, cities in the metro area in Hennepin County, I think they all are. Um, and, and, this, and this community is being asked to bear all of the local impacts of it. Um, and what, what's really difficult is that they, um, this community has been asked to do this over and over and over again over over many years. So Mr. Pass talked about when, you know, the there was a grasshopper issue in the West, and so that benefited a huge group of people, right, who got this pesticide that protected their crops. But the individuals in this community, in this neighborhood, were asked to bear all the burden of that. And 
consequently sit on top of an arsenic superfund site. Similarly, there was a lead smelter located pretty much in the same area right before Hiawatha existed. Um, and again, this was provided services to a larger group of people, and folks right in East Phillips have to bear the burden. It's the same with the asphalt plant, and it's the same with the foundry. And so, it, you know, I think that there's, there's a long-term desire for there not to be so much pollution in this community. And the, this site is located at the, as Representative Wagini has talked about, I mean, it's located on the light rail, which is billions of public investment, located on the Midtown Greenway, which is, you know, this really important amenity and also the result of huge amounts of public investment. And there's concern that this project really cements the industrial character of this corner of this neighborhood, which, as I believe Representative Clark talked about, I mean, like, I wish you guys could come and see it, because you literally have an asphalt plant, like a hot asphalt plant. You can smell it in the summer. And it's separated by a corrugated tin wall, this giant, like, asphalt pit. From It's separated by a corrugated tin wall from... Um, from apartment buildings where children live. There's a, there's a playground out back. There's like a playground, a piece of corrugated tin, and then a hot asphalt pit. And so, you know, I mean, this is a really difficult issue, and I, you know, I, I, I like, we, I know that our, that our city has really compelling reasons for, um, for wanting the, the efficiency of locating um, many different public works uh, functions together, um, but this piece about disproportionality and the way that it's borne out in the health statistics in this neighborhood, I think, really call for a more kind of cautious approach. Um, and you know, I, I just want to say, like the land, the the land use choice that we're making today is going to impact this community for generations, and so. I guess I guess that's the end of my comments, but I, I just I just uh, you know really appreciate the community members for engaging on this issue, um, and I'm thankful for us having this conversation in committee today. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Any other uh, questions from members? Uh, Mr. Chair, there are no further requests. I believe we can go back to Representative Hassan for closing comments. Very good. Uh, uh, Representative Hassan, please, uh, your closing comments, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank um, all the community members who uh, joined us today uh, to share their stories. Um, especially, I want to thank um, Cassie Holmes, who shared... Uh, really um, very powerful and painful um, story from her life. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, this might seem like from the outside that it's uh, an argument between two groups, and I wish it wasn't, didn't seem like that. But in reality, I live in East Phillips, and um, I see the signs of uh, neglect and um, disinvestment and um, environmental racism in this community all over. I just want to say um, we're witnessing the pandemic uh, disproportionately impact the black, brown, and uh, indigenous community across the country. I think it's our responsibility as legislators to protect all Minnesotans from this pandemic and from an uh, environmental racism that has persisted many, many years. And I thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to um, hear this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hassan, uh, for bringing this bill and uh, requesting a hearing. And uh, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, as chair of the committee and, and uh, to my my colleagues uh, on the on the line that, that chose to participate this morning, I, I thank you. This is a 
this is an opportunity, I believe, and uh, that's how I've looked at this from from the first that I, first time I heard about this, and uh, to the development of a, of a bill, and uh, working within the community with the, the city of Minneapolis, with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, and all of the the citizens of this neighborhood. This is an opportunity, and I I just trust in the best way that I can trust. I trust that this will res will result in um, uh, a, a project or projects that the entire community and the city of Minneapolis can can say, look, we did this, we did this good thing. And uh, it just seems like that opportunity is there. That's an, and that's just coming from somebody that I live in the woods, and I'm down here in St. Paul, and I see these these. Uh, this is a different part of the world to me. It's a, all we're all one Minnesota, but this is way different from where I live. And it just it just seems to me that this is such an opportunity to do good things for the neighborhood. The city can do good things for the city. Uh, and and we can move forward in a good way, and perhaps we can reduce pollution and provide good good food. Um, and good food isn't easy to come by in in good times, where a lot of folks that live in the in in the inner city. So so I uh, I just wanted to wanted to say those words and and uh, thank all my colleagues and staff for for us. Uh, Putting this uh, hearing together, uh, Representative Hassan, thank you again, and uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.